I'm Linda Ellerby. It's going to be hard for you to avoid the media noise surrounding the 10th anniversary of the September 11th attacks, which means you may get a lot of information that's wrong. For this reason, Nick News has put together a program for today's kids, explaining just what did happen 10 years ago, what we know and what we don't know. We have intentionally not included in our show the most frightening visuals from that day. Nevertheless, the simple fact of what happened is scary, so we urge you to invite a parent or another adult you trust to watch with you, and then you can talk about what you saw and why September 11th, 2001 is an important date in American history, your history. I heard that on 9-11, 500 planes disappeared in the air. I think they might have smuggled bombs into the planes. I heard that the terrorists came from Pakistan. I heard that they were from Iraq. They could have been Hindu. I think the terrorists were from Japan. I'm pretty sure that Saddam Hussein was the one who ordered this. I heard some people say they think 9-11 never happened. This is Nick News with Linda Ellerby. What happened? The story of September 11, 2001. Now from New York, here is Linda Ellerby. None of what you just heard those kids saying is true, but it's not their fault. Most of you don't remember September 11, 2001. What you know comes from what you've read, seen on TV, or been told, which explains why so many kids tell us what they really have are questions. Okay, start here. It was a beautiful Tuesday morning on the east coast of the United States. The sun was shining. All things considered, America seemed fairly peaceful. This was about to change. In fact, it had already begun. Here is what happened on September 11, 2001. Nineteen men, terrorists working in small groups, had boarded commercial airline flights in Boston, Newark, which is just outside New York, and at Dulles Airport, just outside Washington, D.C. Shortly after takeoff, the terrorists hijacked, that is, they took control of, four commercial airplanes and began to fly those jets themselves. At 8.46 that morning, terrorists flew the first of the four hijacked planes, American Airlines Flight 11, into the North Tower of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. I had just gotten into my classroom and a girl was looking out the window and started screaming, a plane just hit the Twin Towers. My name is Lila. I was 10 years old on September 11th, and my school, PS234, was five blocks away from the World Trade Center. My teacher quickly shut the blinds. In the beginning, I thought it was an accident. My name is Lucas. I was 10 years old on September 11th, and I grew up about a mile away from the World Trade Center. I was homesick that day, and right outside my window, I had a perfect view of the towers. I couldn't hear the crash, but I did hear a bunch of police sirens because they were coming from all parts of the city. What Lucas was hearing was the first of nearly 3,000 emergency personnel, many of whom were off duty that day, making their way to the World Trade Center as fast as possible. I remember firefighters and policemen, emergency workers in general, trying to get to the site to try to save those who they could. My name is McGee, and I live five blocks from the World Trade Center, and I was 11 on September 11th. The order went out to evacuate everybody from the South Tower of the World Trade Center, and thousands of people were able to get safely out of that building before terrorists crashed the second plane, United Airlines Flight 175, into it. The president was visiting a second grade class in Florida. The White House Chief of Staff whispered to him that a plane had hit the second tower. The president, he just sat there and his face just went dead. He had like a blank stare and nobody knew what was going on, so we just went on with the lesson. My name is Jamie. I was seven years old on September 11th and I was in the classroom when George Bush got the news of the attack. You can basically tell like that something happened from his facial expression. It was like he was completely out of the room. While firemen, police officers, and other emergency first responders were still climbing up into the burning buildings, getting even more people out safely, the terrorists crashed the third hijacked plane, 
American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon, the headquarters of the United States military, which is just outside Washington, D.C. And then there was the fourth plane. On board United Airlines Flight 93, a flight attendant using an airline phone had called her headquarters to say that the plane had been hijacked. Other passengers also made calls and found out what had already happened that morning. My name is Sarah. I was 14 years old on September 11th when my sister was a passenger on Flight 93. She called my mother and said, Mom, you know, our plane has been hijacked and I wanted to call and say goodbye. The terrorist turned the jet. Flight 93 was now heading in the direction of the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. But the passengers, knowing what had happened to the other planes, revolted. Faced with an extraordinary circumstance, these passengers and crew banded together and decided that they weren't going to let that plane reach its intended target. And it did not. United Airlines Flight 93 crashed into an empty field in Pennsylvania. There was a struggle for control of the plane. And ultimately, although the lives of the 40 passengers and crew were lost, no other building and no other life on the ground was lost. Back in New York, the South Tower of the World Trade Center, after burning for 56 minutes, collapsed in 10 seconds. I remember there was like one piece of metal just like that loomed there and just like slowly bent down to the side to its collapse. It didn't seem like it was real to me, something that would never happen in real life. 20 minutes later, the North Tower collapsed. At this point, more than one million people, workers, residents, and tourists, were ordered to evacuate a huge area around the site of the World Trade Center. Sure, people were scared, but they did not trample other people. Again and again, you saw strangers helping one another so that everyone could get to safety and eventually home. What I remember most was that this fireman carried me for about half a block right as the first tower collapsed. And I mean, I'll never forget his face or what he looked like. My father was one of the first responders who evacuated people out of the area around Ground Zero. My name is Alexis. I was seven on September 11, 2001, and my father was a paramedic for the New York City Fire Department. Throughout that afternoon and into the night, firemen, cops, construction workers, and other volunteers searched the World Trade Center site and the Pentagon rubble for survivors. That search would go on 24 hours a day for several days. That evening, my dad came home from work and he was covered in dust and soot from the debris. And it was then that I realized that whatever had happened that day was really important. Although nearly 3,000 people died in the World Trade Center, 50,000 worked there. More than 100 died in the Pentagon, but 23,000 people worked there. Hundreds of firefighters, police officers, and other rescue workers died, but thousands did not. And while more than 250 people died on the four hijacked planes, there were many thousands of planes flying that morning that were not hijacked. So as you can see, the story of what did happen on that day is not the whole story, nor does it include what happened next. Here now are some kids with questions and some adults who will try to answer them. My question is, how could the security let those people in when they had weapons? Before September 11th, uh, security was very different than, than what we see today. Then, security specialists were looking for guns, but never for small instruments that could be used as weapons. I am Juliette Kayyem, former Assistant Secretary at the Department of Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security was created after September 11th to unify all of America's agencies to better protect America. This government failed in 
multiple ways to do things to prevent this, this hijacking. One of the ways was that 17 out of the 19 hijackers had either phony passports or some problems with their passport, so they shouldn't even have gotten into the country. My name's Tom Kane. I was chairman of the 9-11 Commission. That was the committee the president appointed to investigate how 9-11 could possibly have happened, and secondly, to make recommendations so that it would never happen again. What I want to know about 9-11 is who was responsible for it and where were they from. I want to know what country they represented and who their leader was. The terrorists who hijacked the four aircraft were average 24 years of age. They all came from the Middle East. They were young Arab males. Fifteen of them came from Saudi Arabia. Others came from Lebanon, from the United Arab Emirates, uh, from Egypt. They all had joined a terrorist group called Al-Qaeda. My name is Bruce Hoffman. I'm a professor at Georgetown University, and I'm the author of the book Inside Terrorism. The terrorists were led by Osama bin Laden, and Osama bin Laden was the son of a wealthy Saudi Arabian family. And he believed that violence in the name of Islam and to create Islamic governments was justified, and that violence against unarmed civilians was justified. We know that Muslims caused the destruction on 9-11. Should we be blaming the majority of Muslims for these actions? Do the majority of Muslims feel this way about America? After 9-11, some people did blame all Muslims, but it was wrong. The terrorists were Muslim. They did something in the name of Islam. But the majority of Muslims in the world uh, condemn violence and condemn what bin Laden did. 10 years after 9-11, with so much interest in Islam, it is still a misunderstood religion and civilization. I'm Akba Ahmed, Chair of Islamic Studies, American University, Washington, DC. The majority of Muslims have the highest respect for the ideals that the United States stands for, the ideals of human rights, civil liberties, justice, democracy. However, a lot of Muslims are unhappy with the foreign policy of the United States. The difference is that a lot of Muslims would write letters, would write books, would get into a discussion, they may have peace conferences, they may protest, they would not want to blow themselves up or blow other people up. That's the difference. One of the strategies Osama bin Laden had was, if possible, to get a war between Christianity and Islam. And every time I see or hear about somebody in this country uh, discriminating in some way or other against a Muslim, that's what bin Laden wanted. They're doing what bin Laden wanted to have happen. And the best thing we can do to get rid of bin Laden's whole legacy is to get along with each other. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations in Afghanistan. A majority of the attackers on 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia and not Afghanistan. Why then did the United States decide to invade Afghanistan instead of Saudi Arabia? Afghanistan was the place where terrorists gathered to train and to work in secret so they could get ready to attack the United States. My name is Ari Fleischer. I'm the former White House Press Secretary under George Bush. The government of Afghanistan was on the side of the terrorists. And so President Bush said, give us the terrorists, give us Osama bin Laden, or we will go to war in Afghanistan to get them ourselves. They did not help us, and so we went to war in Afghanistan to get them ourselves. What I want to know about 9-11 is what motive the people had for doing it. Why would somebody come into the United States and crash into a building, and while they're doing it, they're knowing that they're going to die? What were the terrorists trying to accomplish? What were they trying to do? What were they trying to prove? Al-Qaeda started because a lot of people were unhappy with the leaders in Egypt, or the leaders in Saudi Arabia, or the leaders in Lebanon, or the leaders somewhere. And bin Laden's vision was, a way to get rid of all these leaders is to attack the United States, because a lot of them are friends of the United States. Bin Laden has told us he opposed U.S. foreign policy, which included our support of Israel and our military presence. Um, within the Middle East, and in particular in his, in his home country of Saudi Arabia. I think at the back of his mind, there was the idea that if he could strike the most known symbols of America, the towers in New York representing finance, the Pentagon representing the defense might of America, that with these strikes, the Muslim world, the Muslim population, the Muslim masses would rise and support him. 
he wanted to establish something called a caliphate, which is sort of a big Muslim dictatorship of the world. Bin Laden envisioned himself and Al-Qaeda as a worldwide global movement. And the best way to get attention was to do something spectacular. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. What did 9-11 have to do with the invasion of Iraq? After September 11th and we were hit by a sneak attack, the president made the decision that he would never allow America to be hit by another sneak attack by anybody. The president had been told that Saddam Hussein had some of the biggest, worst weapons you can imagine. These weapons are called weapons of mass destruction. And so to protect America and to make sure that this threat never could strike out at us, the president made the decision to attack Iraq and to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Weapons of mass destruction were not really found. There were senators, there were congressmen, there were uh, former CIA people, there were uh, people privy to the information the United States government had who thought a preemptive strike in Iraq made no strategic sense. I'm Aaron Brown, I'm a journalist. On September 11th, 2001, I was the principal anchor of CNN. Even people who thought the war was a terrific idea have to concede that they totally misunderstood the cost of that war to Americans and Iraqis. In the end, the war in Iraq actually uh, may have made us uh, more at risk from al-Qaeda and terrorists because people in the Arab world were so angry at us for attacking Iraq. Iraq did not have the weapons we should have feared. Uh, stabilizing Iraq took years, not months. Um, and the war and stabilizing Iraq continues to this day. How was Osama bin Laden able to avoid detection for 10 years with such a huge reward over his head? Money wasn't going to catch bin Laden uh, because uh, there was not anybody in that part of the world that he was in who really wanted that much money or afraid if they did turn him in, the money wouldn't be worth anything because they'd be killed immediately by their own people or by Al-Qaeda. So I think the fear of getting killed themselves uh, and the loyalty which he had among his immediate followers kept him safe for a long, long time. As much as we hated him, we did. There were people around the world, Pakistan in particular, Afghanistan certainly, who revered him, who thought, here's the guy that struck out at the evil Americans. I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden the leader of Al-Qaeda. Now that Osama bin Laden has been killed, does that mean the war on terror is over? We're all much better off and safer off because President Obama was successful in killing Osama bin Laden. But it doesn't mean that all his followers are now going to take up knitting. Bin Laden created a terrorist group that over the years has grown, that spread to other countries. That really goes beyond just one man. The challenge is still there but you're already seeing changes in the Muslim world. You're already seeing the young leading revolutions. What's happening in the Middle East is there are a lot of people who are saying, look, we have dictatorships here, and we want freedom. We want to be able to make a good living. We want to vote for our own leaders. And so in places like Egypt and a lot of other countries, they're trying to take control of their own governments, and that's good. While Osama bin Laden wanted to fly planes into buildings and kill people, the young people in Cairo, they removed their corrupt rulers through peaceful revolution. And in that sense, making Osama bin Laden and his method of achieving change irrelevant. I urge you who don't personally remember that day, who perhaps you're only really learning about it now, 10 years later, to remember this. The United States was brutally attacked and thousands of innocent people did die in terrible ways and we must never forget that. But try to let the images you recall from September 11, 2001 be these. Americans, including kids, displaying under the most horrific circumstances 
the triumph of the human spirit. Right after 9-11, there was a lot of support. Everyone in the community came together. I remember flowers, people holding candles, memorials. People looked each other in the eye a lot more. I remember we got this huge box of paper cranes from the school in Japan. My dad's higher house received a lot of letters from kids all around the country thanking them for what they did. Dear rescue workers, I bet that most people wouldn't have the courage to do the job you do. I know that I would be scared to death, but then I'm only a seventh grader. You are the bravest people I know. Some people think singers are heroes, but they're not. You are. Spirits were killed, but American spirit will go on. Through the problems we have, all of you stay strong. This shows me that I should never give up. Dear heroes of the United States of America, I've watched you on TV and I saw you work all day and night. I don't know what America would do without you. I hope that through all that has happened, you still have hope in yourself. You are our country's candle in the darkness. You shine light on us in this time of grief and sorrow. All you workers encourage me to keep going on. I have been praying for all the firefighters who are still fighting. I know my letter is not a medal or it's going to save people, but it's from the heart to give hope, to give love when you are not feeling these things. Thank you. We will survive. For more information, go to nicknews.com.